Thanks very much. Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> that was a, a pretty big <clears throat> welcome, so thank you. And um, I try not to disappoint, although the truth is I've just changed job, actually, so I've spent three months off during the summer. So I think I'd better give a health warning about what I'm going to say, is that much of the data may be horribly out of date, given how quickly the industry is moving. Um, <clears throat> I left Flirtomatic uh, in June, um, and I've just started last week with Fjord, which is a company I set up in... Um, in 2001, and uh, I've gone back there. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. I'm going to leave quite a lot of time at the end for questions, um, because I'm hoping there's going to be a fair few. But my main, my main job today is to talk about mobile billing. And quite a lot of what I'm going to say has been touched on notably by, by Ram earlier on. And I, so I'm going to repeat some themes. But you know, in the spirit of conferences, sometimes it's good to see those themes reappear again and again, because it kind of bangs the, message, the same message home. Um, so Fjord, uh, just a quick word, I'm not here to sell you Fjord, obviously. Um, we set it up in 2001. We had a very clear view that the world was going to get bloody complicated and that what was needed were people who understood cross-platform design. We're now calling that service design. And happily, over the last couple of years, really over the last year, we've begun to see clients actually coming to us and saying we want service design, whereas five years ago, nobody understood what the hell we were talking about. So it was a little bit of an uphill struggle. And it was while we were in that struggle phase that we managed the extraordinary trick, uh, uh, just by luck, I have to say, <clears throat> of doing what the, the guy from us two was talking about, which was inventing a service and then taking it to market ourselves and raising funding for it. And Flirtomatic was that spin out. And I um, sort of span out of, with it, um, out of control, some people would say. Uh, I span out with it, and that's why I then spent six years uh, flirting. Um, Fjord is, in, uh, Fjord is now in, in, I think, seven countries um, with about 170 people, mainly designers. Um, and these are the kinds of people we, we work for. So, so, you know, fairly large brands. They also have recently done some lovely work for Flirtomatic, um, but we're a much smaller client. So let's talk about Flirto um, and, and what I've learned about billing. So if you're not aware, Flirtomatic basically allows people to uh, find flirt and date with other people they'd like to meet. It's, it's in effect a dating application, although when we invented it, we, we, we invented it based off a single question, which was, dating's pretty popular on the web. Bear in mind, this is 2003, 2004. What will dating look like when it goes mobile? Now, I'm, I'm a strong believer, and, and I've never lost this confidence, that things change shape when they change platform. Um, they might still be dating, or they might still be e-commerce, or they might still be book selling. But whatever you do, when you shift platform and, and screen size of that radical change does represent a change in platform, then you're changing the shape of what you do. And when we brainstormed what dating would become, we decided it would be faster, funnier, uh, less dependent on lengthy profiles. If any of you have ever been to a dating site, the serious ones make you fill out very long, very dull profiles, which you're not going to do on a phone, not even in an app. And, and we discussed this, and we thought, what we're, dis what we're discussing here, that sounds like flirting. And of course, everybody in the room had flirted on their phone at one stage or another. So it made, you know, it made absolute sense. This is something tailor-made for the phone, flirting. And that's where, where Flirtomatic was born. Um, we have, at least at my last count, over 4 million registrations. Um, we're very cross-platform. Um, iPhone, Android, mobile web, PC web. I'll come back to that later. I know from the point of view of a startup, being cross-platform is a tall order, and it does bring with it uh, an immense uh, developer complexity. But I am a big believer in this. And uh, I cannot say often enough, if you are planning an app to be only on iPhone, as we were hearing earlier, that's fine, but only as a launch platform. Because I think very few companies are going to really become big, uh, or at least have an interesting exit, if that's what you're looking for, by mentally sticking to just one platform. That's not the way the world is going. Uh, but it does, of course, introduce a whole load of complexity issues, which are very hard to manage. And frankly, we struggled with at Flirtomatic from time to time. Um, Flirto was also uh, one of the very first companies in the world to engage with the freemium model, though it wasn't called freemium at the time. And we did it because um, we had tried very hard with subscriptions, and that hadn't worked out. Subscriptions being a very standard model in the dating industry. So you subscribe for a period of time, a day, a week, a month, whatever it may be. A and it wasn't working. And I remember sitting on a bus in Brixton and thinking, we've got all these messages being sent, because we had millions of flutograms being sent. Um, 
if only we could attach a payment to just one percent of them and I did the numbers pretty quickly we'd have a business and, and that was when I began to think about what we could do and, and gifting was the obvious thing to do that if you could get a customer to attach a gift to a message and get them to pay for it then you could begin to make money and as time went on we discovered there was a lot more than that we could do and I'll, I'll come on to that in a moment um, the product is very sticky so the dwell times are extraordinary. I think that's partly a nature of dating, but it's also partly a nature of the way in which we designed the product to be fun and easy to use. Um, and very, very high levels of page usage, which are now paying dividends for us in terms of advertising revenue. And we're in several territories. Um, so I'm sorry if I'm boring anyone who's heard this before, but I, I think the platform story is interesting and is relevant from a billing perspective because Let's be clear, the billing is different on all of these. And because the billing is different on all of these, you're back with that horrible word complexity, which I was banging on about two minutes ago. So this, this is where life begins to get tough. So initially, coming from a, from a design background, obviously the thought was, let's create the best possible flirting experience we can. And we tried to do it on Java, and, and it was a nightmare. And I remember the CTO at the time describing three different kinds of phones. Uh, he described them as Jaguars, there were really only a couple of those in the market at the time. This is pre-iPhone. Uh, Capris, a little bit of customization. We could just about get the app to work and tractors. And most phones were tractors, especially if they were Motorola's, which was quite troubling at the time because the Motorola, what was the name of the flip phone? The, that, thank you. The Razer was, was the hot thing at the time, but we couldn't make it work on the Razer. And almost just as an experiment, we converted the whole app into, into a WAP site. And just the first moment you played with a website, you realized, shit, this works. And it doesn't have any of the technical complexities of trying to do Java. Let's go with this. And we launched, and it worked very well. And then we, of course, translated it into web, and that worked well too. And the first two or three years were really about struggling with the user experience and getting it right, but really struggling with the billing model. And we began to make breakthroughs in the billing model in about 2007. At the same time, the iPhone launched. We initially went with a web app. We saw very, very poor conversion on that. Um, in 2010, we launched an iPhone app using web views. Um, at that time, I was very keen that we avoid complexity. Um, and using web views seemed like the good way to do that. Uh, very few people were doing HTML5 at the time. Um, but of course, the problem is that however you do it, web views compromises the user experience for, a, for, a, for, a, uh, for an iPhone user. Um, and that was one of the major U-turns we had to make. We could see the iPhone would work for us, especially from a billing perspective, but not if we stuck with web views. So we went for a fully featured app, and at the growing, at right now we have a fully featured app on iPhone um, and on Android, and we're using wrappers uh, for, on GetJar for Java phones and for BlackBerry as well, which by the way work very well and are growing very, very fast for the company. Um, so, Let's talk about making money. Um, I think uh, that mobile, if indeed it's still called mobile in 10 years' time, I think mobile will be the predominant mo uh, advertising medium in the world. Uh, I, have, I, suffer from, I suffer from lots of doubts about all sorts of stuff, but I do not doubt that, uh, that mobile is, is going to be the linchpin of advertising in 10 years' time. And, and we kind of... Um, how, how many people have startups with a board in the audience? Okay, not, not some, some, okay. So some of you will have experienced the, the being beaten up by a board saying, everybody is telling me his mobile advertising is working and I keep reading about it. Where the fuck are the revenues? And, and they just weren't, I mean, the revenues were just, they were 25% of total revenue. We were flying on the freemium side, but they weren't coming in. Actually, by the time I left Floto in June, we were really seeing that change. Now. I, I, I just got a nod from Illy, so he's seeing it change too. But, but I, I wasn't sure at first whether it was just because we got in a red-hot sales guy, which we did, and he began to really kick shit, but, or whether it was the market turning. But I think the market is turning. And given the number of page views that Flutomatic generates, which was getting close to a billion a month uh, by the time I left, um, there's a lot of room to make money there. And we're now seeing really very significant revenues indeed. So I'll slightly moderate what I'm saying there. Um, Supply is outstripping demand. That is changing, that second point, as we speak, uh, from what we can see. Um, everybody knows by now, and I, Flurry uh, came out with this in, in July this year, 
that freemium downloads are now outperforming paid for. That's in the game sector, which as Ram you know, rightly said earlier on, is leading all our thinking um, because they're the ones who seem to be making reasonable amounts of money out there, apart from very, very, very few cases outside games. Um, and, and what we saw clearly, and, and, and we did get right, thank goodness, from day one, was one-off one off payment was not a sustainable business model. And one-off payment is just not a sustainable business model unless you are a games publisher or you're cunning enough to be geared up by a games pub like a games publisher but doing something else, um, which means you need a different set of commercial heads if you're going to run your business like that. Um, but let me say it again. One-off payment is just a shitty business model. It does not work, and I wouldn't go there unless I was a games, a games player. But they, they work on a product life cycle which has very, very, very high uh, rapid turnover. Um, I don't know how many of you saw, I think it was last week, Fierce Mobile Content. Um, half of all games, and I've just said that games is a sector to look at for how they make money, make less than $3,000. Now, I don't think $3,000 is worth getting a bed for in the morning. It might have been if I was 14 and I'd been lucky enough to code something and launch it, which is one of the spectacular things about apps. And we all love those stories. But let's face it, if you want an exit, you're not going to get a decent exit on $3,000. It just isn't going to happen. Um, and that's, that, that, that stat as well suffers from being a bell curve stat. Um, so what you're ignoring there is the very rapid decline and then actually the, the ones who are making the huge amounts of money at the other end, and there aren't very many of them yet. Um, so when it comes to in-app billing, what we see is undoubtedly at the moment Apple are in the lead because of the ease of implementation and the ease for the user. Um, Google are in, in catch-up, and it's, you certainly wouldn't bet against them completely catching up, but it's taking a bit of time. Um, don't discount the mobile internet. So I can't tell you what proportion it was, or I shouldn't tell you, but the proportion of revenue at Flirtomatic that was coming through mobile internet through traditional mobile aggregators like uh, M-Blocks, um, is just extraordinary. So if you have the capacity to build on the mobile internet, there is a lot that can be done there in terms of generating revenue, because actually it's very well geared up. There is a caveat to that I'll come on to. Um, lastly, the 70-30, the notorious 70-30. Um, I don't think that can hold, and I do not think it will hold, and I think we will see a lot better than that over time. If you talk to the mobile aggregators like MIG, they will privately concede that that is changing now. Uh, and that we will, it, you can now do deals with carriers which are 80-20. But Apple, unless I missed something while I was away over the summer, Apple is still on 70-30, correct? I just don't see that holding. Um, and I think Android will be the ones who probably blow it out with, with the carriers. So um, how did we make the money that we were making at Flirtomatic? We did it with a, an extraordinary blend of actually 18 different revenue lines. So... Probably based on my experience here, I am a big fan of not betting all your, was it one of my VCs called it, a one-legged stool. You know, you don't want a one-legged stool. You may be able to balance on it for a little while, but eventually it'll fall over and you feel the pain. You know, you need several legs to your revenue. Um, and even um, within a social network, as I think Facebook are now discovering and have been doing, beginning to do extremely well with Facebook credits, you need lots of different ways in which you can get the revenue flowing. And Facebook are lucky enough to have an army of developers effectively doing that for them, using Facebook credits as a way through. On, on Flirtomatic, I won't bore you with the details, but we eventually, I, I subdivide it mentally into, into five things. Gifting, which initially a lot of people focused on as being the story, but it was only ever 20 to 25% of the revenues. Um, visibility, that is what people are really, really interested in paying for. We had people paying... Um, at some cases, we have people paying 60 or 70 pounds a day, this is men mainly, in order to make themselves more visible to women mainly. Um, the, the third one is vanity. So typically women would spend more on this. Um, and we, you know, we had stuff where people could uh, spend money on improving their ratings. So we had cheat buttons basically. You could spend money, it would improve your ratings, and you would look better to the outside world. I used to think of it as digital Botox. Um, and then alerts, which is a very, very standard mobile use case, somewhat eviscerated by Apple 
and their decision to do alerts effectively and notifications for free. So it became much harder to charge for alerts at that stage, and that increasingly looks like something people expect for free. Um, we also charged for location initially, and finally had to begin to back away on that because look, peak customers now expecting location for free. So this is a you know it's a wobbly ride there doing this stuff because actually market expectations change and you find that something which was a very secure revenue stream one year becomes considerably less secure the next year because there's a whole load of people like Foursquare and GoWala out there offering location for free and probably quite rightly too. Um, so this is not a, a fixed picture by any means. And lastly, photos where we uncovered a route to get people to spend a lot more money. Uh, we did all of this through um, uh, credits, which we called flirt points at a variety of different price points. Um, and we used all those different uh, ways of, um, of getting payments. One thing, one last point on this that I would make is um, conversion to payment is the most powerful uh, statistic that you have in your business. So when I sat and looked at um, all the numbers that we could do, when I was doing uh, projections for the year, the single biggest change that you could get on the effectiveness of the business was increasing conversion to payment, more than increasing ARPU. Um, a one percentage change from, say, 14% conversion to payment to 15% conversion to payment flows through dramatically to the bottom line and has more impact than anything else you can do. New users, conversion at the front gate, ARPU, anything like that. It is the key number to watch out for because if you get high conversion to payment and you can push it up just two or three percentage points, then you're really in business. So, as I said, there's a whole number of different billing routes at the moment, and, and I'm, I'm uncomfortably aware there'll be a number of people in the room who are at least as familiar and probably more familiar with these than I am. Um, so iTunes clearly heads the list at the moment. In theory, it's good. It suffers, of course, and we've, we've heard prolonged wails, particularly from media publishers over the last year, the amount of control that Apple have over this. And I think, in particular, you know, we've seen, I'm sure a lot of people are aware of, of uh, the FT's move towards um, running stuff much more over HTML5. So, and, and they're doing it blatantly so they can avoid Apple's subscription rules. So there is a lot of control there exercised by Apple, and you have to be very aware of that. There's also what I call the long ta tale of despair. Um, now, I call it the long tail of despair because um, I know, and you can look now if you want, I know where Flirtomatic is in social networking on the iTunes store in terms of um, uh, amount of money being made. You can see it, it's clear. They don't say what the money is, they just say where we are. And, and I looked about half an hour ago and we're number five in the UK, which is pretty good. I also know how much money Flirtomatic is making, a and it's good, and we've got a business there, and it's you know, venture backed, and you know, it's growing. But when I think about how much more money we're making, and I look at the people who are down at number 20, or number 30, or number 40, I begin to really worry about how they're going to survive and how much money they're making. And I think it gets worse than that. You know, a lot of people, I think, naively put a great deal of store on being promoted by Apple in the iTunes store. Apart from the fact that it's very, very difficult to achieve, even if you do achieve it, the results can be distinctly unimpressive. I know this because I tracked two companies for the whole of the first half of this year who were close to us, companies I know, not direct rivals, just companies I know. And they got, they got stuff I would have died for from Apple in terms of promotion. It didn't even move the needle for them. And in one particular case, I know the CEO confirmed that to me as being true, but just you can see, because you can just track where they are in terms of their revenues and in terms of where they are. So being under new and noteworthy doesn't necessarily do it for you, uh, and, and it's difficult to achieve. I find that troubling, because I think we have a, as Ram said uh, you know, well earlier, we have a, um, uh, and a very asymmetrical marketplace here, and I don't think that yet we're seeing the, the full solutions for that out there. Uh, Google Checkout is obviously implemented, but again, there are you know, problems with that, and we have problems with whether, I mean, the obvious problem with Google Checkout is almost everybody um, certainly in the US and the UK, have an iTunes account of one kind or another, um, you have to be persuaded to go and do Google Checkout because there isn't an obvious reason to go and get it. And, and that means they're still lagging behind. Direct with carrier. So 
Direct with carrier deals work very, very well, and, but they are in decline and they are declining rapidly. So right now, um, right now, I don't think it's too difficult to get a direct carrier deal. You have to do a lot of talking. They can be a pain in the ass to work with sometimes, but then, hey, so can Apple. Um, and, um, and they won't necessarily do what they say as quickly as they say they will do it. On the other hand, if you can get representation in the portal, it will still drive customers to you. What you will also see is after initial blip, it begins to decline. So it's worth going after as, a, as part of your portfolio and your marketing mix. And the direct deal with a carrier means that you will get at least 70-30. And certainly in the UK, you should be able to do better than that now if you negotiate hard. Um, but it is hard to achieve and it's not going to scale. And it isn't the way the world is going. So you have to question whether or not you want to make the effort. But it will, if you can do it, give you revenue driver in, in the short term. Um, you can also go with a local integrator. So obviously going with a local integrator like MIG, you get all the carries in the UK immediately, much easier to achieve. Payout rates actually aren't that much worse because they're in a volume business and they take very little slice off the top. Um, in the US, it's a bloody nightmare. We did six uh, integrations in the US because there is no one aggregator, unless things have changed, who covers the whole of the US in one go. Um, and if anyone tells you they can, really, really dig into that hard because they're probably not telling you the full picture. So we ended up mixing local integrator with lots of direct with carrier work in the US. Um, then you had the new breed integrators, and I think this is a market definitely to watch. Um, particularly, uh, it's not rocket science to say that Zong have got to be one to watch. Now they're part of the PayPal family. Um, and, and some of you know that the CEO of Zong has now become head of mobile payments at PayPal. Um, so I think there'll be stuff happening there, and they're definitely an interesting one to watch. Um, payouts are very variable, and there is another issue I'll come on to in a moment. Credit and debit card, don't ignore it. Customers are willing to put in their credit card details onto phones. It was something like 10% of our pay total payments at Flirtomatic, which I think is a big number. Uh, and, and, of course, especially a big number because um, uh, you get about 95% of it flowing through to the bottom line. Um, so that's got to be great. But uh, there are pretty tight rules around data storage, and that can be tough for a startup. Relatively easy for a large company who can afford the people who know how to do it. Harder if you're a startup. Um, and then, of course, PayPal. Great payout, uh, but I think they need some help. And they went and bought some with Zong. We'll see what happens next there. Um, you may be familiar with this chart, and I apologize. This is a year old, but I think it tells an interesting picture. So this is where... Um, uh, um, Flurry saw uh, companies, the top 25 companies that Flurry track had moved from basically being dependent on advertising revenue in 2009 to about a year ago, the advertising revenue being about 10% of their mix, which is exactly what we saw at Flirtomatic, more or less. Note that blue line doesn't just get a lower part of the mix, but it's actually in decline. I think since then that's reversed. I certainly saw it reversing at Flutomatic, as I said earlier, but I can't actually prove that statement. Um, two more things. This picture up at the top is one of my favorite. I said I was schizoid about this, and my least favorite. So it's favorite because it tells a very interesting story. That shows you the um, payment failure rate for Flutomatic over a I think a, uh, a year, over a year, on one particular billing platform. And I'm not going to tell you what the billing platform is. Um, and I won't tell you what the country is either. Actually, I think it's a blend of a couple of countries. Where it spikes at the top there, that goes up to about 70%. Now, if you look at that across the year, you might look at it and say, you know, OK, it's not changing that much. But let me tell you. You're running one of these companies, and you get one of these, you think, holy shit, because the, the, that, that gap is a really huge gap, and you see the revenues. And look at the way it goes up and down. There's something going on there, um, and, and it's not always easy to tell what it is that's going on that's driving this. Um, now, these uh, failure rates are not something you see with Apple, because they hide it from you. So you just don't see it. At least I'm pretty sure that's true. You don't see this with Apple. You probably won't see it with Google Checkout. Pretty much everybody else you work with, 
you need to be asking for these failure rates and you need to be looking at them and examining them because they bedevil the industry and they're caused by a whole number of different things. They could be caused by a customer saying, yeah, I want to buy, oh, no, I've, made a, I've changed my mind. Or they could go into an area where there's mobile service dropout just as they're paying and the, and the, and the payment gets. Or it could be, this definitely happens, that there has been some kind of systemic failure either at the carrier or the aggregator or at your end. And you then need to go, the problem with this, of course, is you can see immediately there's heaps of missing revenue at the places where that you know, goes up. It takes an enormous amount of investigative horsepower and muscle power to find out what's happened every time you get one of those. And you know, with a small development team, it's enormously distracting. Is that making sense? I, I, I think that's almost the most important thing I can show you. Um, so I think change is on the way. Um, clearly, we're going to see more with Android. Um, carriers, I think, are responding well by looking at, uh, you know, and, um, and uh, James from Blue Veer is here and, is, you know, is a good example of how carriers are really working very hard to provide added value information to anyone who's doing billing. I, I personally think that the biggest change over the next five years uh, will come from um, these two last points here. So I think as we get, um, as the device itself becomes a payment mechanism in the real world, so I think gradually the, um, the dividing lines between a near-field communication payment device, i.e. like the Oyster card, I put it on something I pay on the spot, the dividing lines between that as a billing mechanism and um, payments to iTunes or payments over the air through Vodafone or, or Orange or O2, that will begin to disappear and it will just become one payment device. The moment there's a lot of activity going on and ex, you know, a lot of fevered um, speculation about NFC um, and, the, and the US carriers have all got together to look at this area as well. Um, so there is a lot happening there and I think that will impact on our space enormously. Happily, I think one of the impacts will be we'll shift to a much more credible revenue share. And, you know, you don't, again, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know if you move from 70-30 to 95-5, you make an enormous difference to your bottom line and to your investors as well. Um, last point. So I've been talking about billing. My personal perspective, based on what I've seen at Flotomatic and what I can see elsewhere, is billing is not the issue. Billing is not the big problem. It's kind of there. It's getting better. It takes a lot of time and energy. I've told you a lot about that today. The thing I worry about is retention and distribution. This flurry chart was published, I think, just... Uh, can you read it at the back? Okay. It was published just about um, uh, two, three weeks ago, I think. Um, so it's pretty new. This is retention over 90 days. So anybody on this side of here is not keeping users. They're only keeping 25% or worse of users after 90 days. That's a pretty horrible illy. Oh, this is um, iOS and uh, Android. Thank you. Um, I think that's a pretty scary number. I mean, you know, I, I've got to say at Flutomatic we saw better numbers than that. Um, and we were in this side of the chart, not the other side of the chart. But below 25% is that there's a lot of, that's a lot of dead men walking out there. That's what I would worry about, is how you keep customers and how you find them in the first place. Billing is kind of on the way. And certainly, and the last point I'll make, if you're looking at funding, one of the areas where, where, we, where, where I think I learned a big lesson with Flutomatic was it's fine to be inventive and create a wonderful revenue model, which we did, which then generated good revenues, et cetera, et cetera. But once you've proved a little bit of that, put that on one side and let it roll for a while. Worry about where you're going to get all the customers from because that's where you're going to get decent funding at decent valuations. Um, was it Tumblr valuated at $800 million this week? You know, and they're, not making, they're hardly making anything. And you look at that and you think, they didn't fix the revenue model, but they sure as hell got something on the acquisition side. This is a chart to focus on.
Thank you very much.